a fun topic here at Blue Glow Electronics today. Hi-Fi tube amplifier chassis design considerations. Uh, so basically the things you need to think about and uh, how to lay out and build a chassis for your uh, Hi-Fi tube amplifier. Um, AKA the single-ended tube amplifier build part nine. So I've got a series going on on how to build a single-ended tube amplifier. But this video could also be a great standalone video and um, teach you something whether you're watching that series or not. Okay, some of the topics we're going to cover today, chassis materials, chassis size, um, all the components that need to be mounted, chassis layout considerations, transformer orientation, heat, um, power line or line power interactions, and a little bit about tube socket orientation and layout. Um, hang tight, this is going to be fun. Okay, as it relates to chassis materials, there's a lot of options out there, but the two you will most likely encounter are aluminum chassis or steel uh, slash iron chassis. Um, there are other options, but that is what, uh, if you go buy a pre-made chassis, it will likely be one of these two. And there's pros and cons to each. Uh, first off, aluminum, much, much easier, easier to work with. So if you don't have access to a machine shop and the types of tools that would be in a machine shop, and you're just using some, uh, some tools around the house, maybe like a small drill press, um, you know, some cutter tools, um, whatnot. Aluminum is going to be much, much easier to work with. Um, one downside, it's not as strong or sturdy, so you got to be careful of how thin the aluminum chassis is and will it withstand the weight of the transformers. These transformers can weigh five, seven, ten pounds a piece sometimes. You got to, uh, got to consider that when you're considering an aluminum chassis. One pro for the aluminum, it does not propagate magnetic flux interactions well. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later, but uh, aluminum seems to be um, considered more superior in that case. Um, it also creates a better ground plane for, uh, for grounding. So if you're tying various points of your chassis together for grounding purposes, um, the aluminum facilitates being a better uh, conductor and a better ground plane than steel or iron would. Um, over to the steel and iron, it is more difficult to cut, drill, modify, as we talked about. If you're just trying to cut out like the power connector in a steel chassis, that can be a, uh, a laborious, uh, uh, tedious type uh, activity, I can tell you. Um, one pro, it's very rigid and stir you know, rigid and sturdy, um, will, will stand a lot of weight, doesn't flex or bend easily, so uh, you don't have to worry as much about that. Uh, back to uh, kind of the inverse of what we talked about, it does propagate magnetic currents, um, so we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. And overall, it adds weight. Um, you know, you're already dealing with a lot of weight coming from the transformers. Uh, the steel chassis is just going to add some more weight. However, having said all of that, both are very viable choices and regularly used. I don't care whether it's guitar amps or hi-fi amps or whatnot. You see a lot of steel being used. You see a lot of aluminum being used. Um, in our case here today, you're going to see we're going to work with an aluminum chassis because I'm trying to do something that the average Joe at home could, um, could do themselves without a lot of uh, machine shop type tools. And there are other options out there, copper, nickel, wood. The only downside to some of these others, like um, Dynaco used to make their chassis uh, steel, but then they nickel coated them with that nickels all, the plating's all flaking off and uh, pitting at this point in time. So it didn't hold up well over time. Copper, the same thing, you'll end up with oxidization or um, corrosion taking place. Wood, you really don't have a good way to mount a lot things to it and uh, doesn't create you any type of uh, ground plane for um, for your ground chassis. So at any rate, there are other options out there, but aluminum, steel, the two primary ones, both are great choices. Personal, my personal preference would be aluminum if I was uh, making a choice. Okay, as far as chassis size go, you want to make sure that your chassis is large enough to work with and to give you just a little extra room so you're not working down inside of tight, tight cramped places. Um, the one I've chosen here, as you can see, is 12 inches wide and it is uh, 10 inches deep and it is actually um, here 2 inches tall. So that gives me enough room to lay out my components. I have a little extra room here or there as well as um, you know enough room underneath here to work with. It's a nice little chassis. It's the Hammond um, 
1444-29 says heavy duty chassis um, 0 0.051 inch aluminum. I wish the aluminum was a little bit thicker on this one, like more like a 0.7 or 0.8, but I can live with the uh, the 0.51. It's strong enough. You'll see here in a minute to uh, to actually hold what we're we're dealing with. But um, that's the size chassis I've chosen. It's it's a good size. It'll uh, fit well up on a uh, on a desk or credenza or whatever you're uh, you're putting your uh, stereo amplifier up onto. Uh, you know, Hammond makes bigger ones. You can get the three inch tall. You can get uh, much wider and longer. I just like to try to keep it as compact as I can, but yet still fit all the components quite well. Okay, one thing you've got to consider here: all the components here that kind of make up the tube amplifier, uh, both the power supply and the uh, the internal components. You want to think about the ones that physically mount to the chassis itself. Things like this transformer here, uh, things like these tube sockets here, things like if we put an input switch, things like this potentiometer, things like the power transformer, fuses, um, power outlets, things of that nature that are going to, these 10 Henry chokes, things that are going to need to physically mount to the chassis itself. And as you can see here, um, there's a lot to consider. I mean, if you look at that, um, there's a lot here we're going to stuff in this thing. We've got two output tubes here. We've got two 10 Henry chokes. We've got two output transformers. We've got a power transformer. We've got a rectifier. We've got three here, um, 6SN7 tubes, IEC power connector, RCA input jacks. Um, two sets of banana jacks here for the outputs. We got a fuse holder here. We've got a power switch. Um, we've got our 100k potentiometer. Um, whoops, that's an extra. And I'm probably missing a couple. Oh, yeah, the little LED that we're going to put on the front of this thing to light up. But all this stuff right here, every bit of it has to physically mount to this chassis. So as you can see. There's a lot there, and uh, and for a chassis that's, uh, as you can see here, not much bigger than all that stuff, um, we're going to have to consider our design uh, layout uh, pretty seriously. Some things to consider as you are laying out your chassis. Uh, first off, electromagnetic induction, and we'll talk more about what that is. Heat. You've got to watch out for heat from components interacting or getting close to other components and uh, maybe causing them to dry out. A good example would be you would not want to strap a bypass resistor right beside a bypass capacitor. Um, even though on a schematic that's the way they're drawn, um, you could end up the heat from that resistor could dry out that capacitor and cause a kind of premature failure of it. Got to watch out for voltage drops. In other words, these are small little signals, especially your uh, input signals in an amplifier. You don't want really long runs of wire. Want to keep all that to a minimum. Um, electrostatic induction we will talk about as well. Um, that would be things like um, the sinking of your cell phone in the air or maybe um, you know, a 60 hertz hum that's on your uh, power line getting too close to a, uh, an input um, signal and in inducing you know some 60 Hertz hum into your overall um, signal being amplified yeah you want to watch out for mechanical and safety in other words you don't want to get too close you know um, components too close to each other where you know high voltage may arc over um, you want to make sure you've got good grounding, things of that nature. You want to make sure you're putting a metal, cha um, you know, a lid on the bottom of your chassis or cover to make sure no one uh, sticks their fingers in there. If you're in the case of this 807 amplifier, if you're running plate caps up, that you're using really good insulated wire and rubber grommets so that the uh, the um, metal chassis doesn't cut into the um, insulation of the wire and start arcing. Um, just overall acoustical, you know, you want to make sure this thing's got some good rubber feet on the bottom of it and that as you walk across the, the floor in your room that it's not uh, vibrating the chassis, causing microphonics in your small signal uh, tubes. And then finally, you know, just the overall aesthetics. How does this thing look? So, you know, what may be the best electrically or electromagnetically? 
may not be the best looking amplifier so you got to weigh out the pros and cons of that we can we can talk about that a little more in depth here as we get into it all right earlier we mentioned electromagnetic induction and what it really comes down to is something called transformer currents and those matter as it relates to transformer orientation so somewhere in a physics or science class in your life I'm sure you took a battery, wrapped a, wrapped a uh, coil of wire around an iron nail and hooked a battery up to it and all of a sudden you made an electromagnet, an electromagnet that would pick up um, other metallic devices. Um, so if you think about that, what you've got is a winding of a coil of wire wound around some type of core. Well guess what a transformer is? It is nothing more than a windings of copper or silver typically around an iron core um, and these iron cores as you do that they actually produce something called eddy currents and you can see here a diagram on the left um, this would be a solid core um, transformer and the eddy currents in a solid core transformer get really big and you can see kind of protruding out of them would become um, what's known as the uh, you know the flux or uh, magnetic currents flowing out of the iron core and so um, to minimize that um, people use laminated so you have a bunch of little bitty currents and they never get to kind of magnify themselves and get really big when you're using lamination so you actually laminations help reduce this some but they don't get rid of it completely and as you can see here if you kind of lay a transformer out uh, this is a top-down view well this thing would actually be producing um, these currents uh, to the left and to the right here leaving out the ends of the transformer and if you kind of laid one like this it would actually be coming out the top the left the right and the bottom but since um, it's kind of flowing out the top that those currents go up in the air and there's really no electrical components above that so we don't really care about those the ones flowing down um, we don't really care a lot about those either other than I can say an aluminum chassis does a better job of not propagating these to other parts of the amplifier um, but what we do care about these currents going left and right here or from a top-down view left and right those are the ones we most have to worry about one thing that can help a little bit but not it does not eliminate um, these currents is to actually use a potted transformer in other words your transformer is then dropped inside of some type of metal canister and you can see a lot of the old uh, famous transformers here the old Dynaco, old Altec, uh, the classic Western Electric 171C's here they're all potted transformers and they not only do they help keep out dust and moisture and whatnot, but they also can help cut down a little bit on these uh, currents. And this is a modern James transformer here that's uh, made inside of a, a potted chassis as well. Some, something to think about. That's why you typically see most of your extremely high-end um, audio transformers or potted transformers. All right, first and foremost, there's a book out here called Building Valve Amplifiers by Morgan Jones. It's a great book to cover all the topics we're discussing today, plus uh, many, many more. This book is all about chassis design, layout, physical connections, you know, your tube sockets, um, gets into how to cut, you know, proper socket connectors, um, on and on how to solder a well, talks a little bit about testing once your amplifier is built, but what it does not do is teach you anything about amplifier design, but I actually like the fact they made this a separate book. If you get a chance, uh, pick one of these up, uh, Morgan Jones. These, these books are uh, all made in the last 10 years or so. Pretty good stuff. Morgan also made um, a book here called Valve Amplifiers. This is the fourth edition, and this is kind of the de facto standard for a good electrical engineer on all types of circuits, circuit design, circuit consideration. I will tell you it's a step above what the average person that has never um, had a lot of math background, physics, and or maybe electrical knowledge. Um, but you probably still learn a good bit uh, just to really understand everything in this book. It may take um, maybe a uh, some electrical classes or some good uh, math and physics but 
anyway grab that book if you get a chance it will help you a lot with uh, chassis design but let's let's talk a little bit about if you'll remember this was one of the transformer options we had it's the Hammond 6k7 VG it was actually the least expensive option we could have went with when we were specking out the 807 amplifier and these Ed core transformers um, were a low cost option for a uh, if you'll notice these are the GS GXSE 15-8-5K. In other words, primary 15 watt, 5,000 ohms on the uh, primary and 8 ohms on the secondary. Great little uh, transformers for what we need here. But you notice how I've got these things laid out right now. This is the least optimal way we could possibly lay these out and put them on the chassis. And why is that? Remember earlier we talked about these uh, currents. Um, electromagnetic currents flow out of the transformers this way the same with this transformer they flow out this way they're coming out the tops here we don't really care about how they come out at the top or the bottom but what we care about is this because this power transformer and the currents it's producing is going to interact with the currents uh, flowing in these uh, output transformers and it could actually cause you some issues of hum um, if you've ever taken two electromagnets and tried to put them together like this, um, if you'll remember you get a lot of resistance. Well, that resistance plays out in your audio world as hum. So, two ways to fix this uh, problem that you've got when you're designing this amplifier. First and foremost, you could turn the transformers this way. And uh, then you're at 90 degree angles. You've got um, your kind of your currents flowing this way and current flowing this way and they're not interacting with each other and you would be good to go. We'll talk in a minute about why this may not be the optimal layout though. Uh -huh. Another way you could lay these out would be to simply turn this transformer here in the middle and turn leave these two facing that way. And in my opinion this is the optimal layout um, for this chassis if you were going with this style transformer. And we'll talk more about why here in a minute. And let's take a look at what we actually decided to use, which was this Classic Tone 40-18029 transformer. And remember, it'll actually mount in here like this, top down. The good news is, take a look. We've got the currents flowing out of this. At, even though they're flowing in the same direction here as this transformer, they are at completely... 90 degree angles to each other so they kind of um there's a built-in canceling canceling effect there if i was to turn this transformer this way it would be bad news but um i'll actually mount that thing i'm going to sit it upside down here just to kind of represent so you'll have currents flowing in this plane here but you'll have currents flowing in this plane out of this transformer optimal in my opinion all the way around i really like this uh design and layout I will say the one downside to this transformer versus this transformer, this one all you have to do is drill four holes here to mount it and then one big hole in the bottom here for the wires to go through. This one you're going to have to cut out a, uh, you know, a big chunk of chassis, a little square like this for this whole thing to drop down in and then you're going to have to put these squares there. If you're working with steel, that's a pretty tough job, but since we're using an aluminum chassis, it won't be all that bad. We can use a nibbler to do that with. Um, but we just got done talking about what was called um, electromagnetic induction, right? And we talked about interaction between the power transformers and the output transformers. Another thing you have to consider that I had on my, um, on my little syllabus was the interaction between output tubes and transformers. And if you'll notice here, I think it's on our page 10 or so. Yep, right here on page 10 of Morgan Jones' book up here. He shows you right here um, beam valves and main transformers. And there's a whole section in here he talks about this. But you can see how the, uh, the little currents are flowing out of this transformer, right? And he says here, what you do not want is your beam um, forming plates of, your, uh, of a beam triode or tetrode being affected by those actual currents. So having these transformers turned sideways like this, and then you would have your tubes right here, these currents would could 
interact directly with the uh, beam forming that's taking place inside of a beam tetrode or, or pentode. Um, these 807s, a, um, any, any type of compactron tube, um, KT88 would be a great example of a tube you would not want to do that with. So uh, mm -hmm. I think your ideal scenario is to kind of keep it like this, keep the transformer going in a different direction, and then uh, you can mount your tubes just like that. And one last thing on this uh, transformer orientation uh, topic. I thought this was pretty interesting. Uh, it's a February 1929 Popular Science um, magazine. You can you can Google for it, but um, it's basically saying uh, useful transformer test. And what they talk about here is basically you connect 110 volts, um, just your primary, across the input of all your transformers, like I had on the bench right there. You connect 110 volts across each one of them. And then across the outputs of um, one of the output transformers, you would connect basically a high impedance headphone, just a set of uh, plain old um, iPhone headphones or something. And um, then you basically just start turning and orienting the transformers to see what interactions between them. And you'll actually be able to listen to the hum. Um, and you want to you want to orient these things until you've minimized the hum and you. You may be saying, wow, why would somebody use this article from 1929? Well, I can tell you that people do. Um, out on some of the uh, the more prevalent um, tube, tube gear builder websites, they talk about using this technique that was originally founded here in this article. But, um, you know, something to, something to explore. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but if it piques your interest, um, you can start Googling it. There's a, uh, a lot of info out there on it. But it's kind of a more maybe... Uh, uh, more scientific way of uh, making sure that you're reducing as many uh, of these uh, transformer interactions as possible. Okay, let's talk a little bit about heat. So one thing I forgot to show earlier um, in all those components that had to be figured out where we're going to mount them is two of these. We're going to have uh, a couple 32, 32s at 50 um, volts here and if you'll notice um, in the schematic they had 33's but uh, the 32's will work just fine but you're going to end up with uh, one, two, three of those and uh, you can get two inside of one but you can't get three inside of one so I'm going to end up with two of these and what you would not want to do is uh, let's just say uh, mount this close to that this tube is going to produce heat all the time you do not want your capacitors getting hot um, or the same, uh, don't mount it right next to a transformer like that. You might want to leave, you know, a half inch of space there. Or if you were going to mount some of these, you know, g give it a little room like that, a good uh, inch if you're away from power tubes. Because um, heat is the number one thing that causes capacitors to dry out, break down, and fail on you uh, prematurely. Similarly, you're going to be mounting things like this power transistor. Well, let me show you here. Um, in the schematic, you actually see here uh, 100 microfarad at 63 volts in parallel with this 390 at 10 volts, right? Well, wow, that would, that would, if I did exactly what the schematic showed me, it would look just like that, right? They're right in parallel with each other. Uh, the downside is this resistor is going to produce a lot of heat. It's going to dry this capacitor out really fast. Um, so you're going to want to keep these things a good, uh, you know, finger lift apart between each other here. Um, and not have them side by side like this. Um, similarly, you've got another point right here in the schematic, uh, this 100 microfarad and this 82 ohm. You'd not want to do the same thing there. And likewise, this uh, this capacitor, I mean, this resistor in general is a power resistor, and it's going to produce some heat in and of itself. So wherever you mount that inside the chassis, one mounting it to the chassis helps the heat dis helps the heat dissipate a little bit into the chassis. But two, you would you know keep a, keep components away from that, uh, give a little spacing on either side. Um, similarly, between the power transformer, sometimes they produce a little bit of heat. Certainly, this rectifier tube will produce some heat. Would not want this capacitor, let's say, right there, right up against that thing. Okay, something to think about here is your AC power interactions with other components inside the amplifier. So one of the things you're going to want to do is keep your AC power feeds, which have 60 hertz AC on them, as far away from these input tubes right here 
as well as any, um, let's say, the RCA jacks that maybe would feed these input circuits here. Um, you're going to want to keep that AC as far away from that as you can. So like maybe the AC is coming into your IAC connector, feeding into a fuse, coming around on the side of the chassis, feeding both of these um, 10 Henry chokes, feeding the power switch here. And this is not an exact electrical representation. I was just kind of drawing in general. You would want to run lines around the chassis, um, which are then ultimately going to end up feeding into, oops, your rectifier. And I drew those to the wrong place here. I meant to say down here into your uh, into your pre-op um, stages here, but you're going to want to keep um, your AC signals feeding. Think you got to think about where those AC signals flow: power line, fuse holder, chokes, power switch, rectifier. This whole uh, whole space right in here is dealing with the uh, 60 hertz hum here as well as some feeds that would actually end up going um, along here um, and into the power transformer so anywhere you do have to make a, um, a crossing of power lines and um, signal you want to do it like I did right here at 90 degree angles um, if you're running some AC power lines like that and then beside of it you're running um, just like this, some small signal um, lines, then you're likely to uh, induce um, via induction there some current, some of that 60 hertz AC hum into that signal. So anywhere you can cross at right angles. The other thing would be anywhere you're running small signal um, lines like this. Try not just to use, you know, a uh, a plain old wire like this, try to use um, shielded cable that you would ground on both ends and then on the inner center conductor would be where your actual signal would flow. But just something to think about. Um, the book will talk more about it if you pick up Morgan Jones' book, but you're going to want to try to keep these a this AC away, especially from your small signal because that's where that uh, small signals might get induced and amplified really big. By the time you get to the output tubes here, you may be dealing with a uh, Let's just, I'll just say a 20 or 30 volt peak to peak, um, you know, audio signal, uh, you know, just a small, small little microvolt uh, signal is not going to cause that much interference at that point. But if you're playing with it up here on the input, it could make a big difference because then that, that AC hum is going to get amplified all the way throughout the amplifier. All things to consider. Okay, and finally the, just the overall considerations of how to lay things out. I think this in general is what I've decided to go with. As you can see, we've got the, the mains power transformer here in the middle, the two output transformers to each side of it. Um, I've then got the uh, two 807s sitting in front of that. About a half inch away from the uh, mains there, I'm going to put the rectifier tube. And then up from that a little bit, uh, somewhere along in here, I'm going to put in place the three uh, success and sevens that we'll need. And if you'll remember, these chokes have got to mount underneath the chassis. So this will likely go underneath about right along in here. And you have to consider what's underneath when you're mounting things on top. In other words, you couldn't have this underneath the chassis right here. And then decide to put a tube, tube right there because um, you know the tube would, uh, the pins would protrude downward through the chassis and to the top of this. So you kind of have to take into consideration what's on top and what's underneath when you're doing your ultimate layout. Similarly, this choke over here will sit in this corner. These chokes are eating up a good bit of my, my valuable real estate. I'll likely end up with a power switch um, way over here near one of these, um, you know, mounted in here. Near one of these chokes, matter of fact, I may take that choke back far enough to just put it right along in here. And then I'm also going to have this potentiometer I've got to worry about somewhere in here. Um, probably mount it along in there and maybe put the uh, little LED over there. Or we could uh, come from the bottom up through somewhere with the uh, with this. Sometimes you see I'm mounted on top of chassis, but I'll likely go out the front. Maybe I'll go with the power switch on one side right here and this potentiometer on the other side uh, right along in here. The other thing you got to pay attention to, let me spin this thing around, 
is kind of your space here in the back because you've got to have somewhere for a fuse to connect in so you're going to have to have enough space there that's the reason I moved this transformer forward a little bit the same as I'm going to need space for this IAC connector I wanted to put both of those right along in here and keep the power here keep the power away from what would be the outputs and then I thought I would put one set of outputs on one side like this another set of outputs over here the reason for that is your leads from the output of the transformer will actually connect directly to these so you could have just a one or two inch connection going to those and then I've got to figure out where I'm going to put these RCA jacks my guess is I'm going to come over here on one side um, and go up and down with one on the top and one on the bottom and keep it kind of away from this power section keep it over here closer to one of the output transformers is kind of what I'm thinking at this point in time so so I intentionally did not slide all that all the way to the back I'm going to leave a little bit of space here um, to be able to put in uh, the fuse holder and IC connector and then I've also got to consider where am I going to run my leads up um, um, from from here up to the plate caps that will have to connect on top of these tubes and I've also got two of these to figure out where to mount somewhere underneath um, my guess is they'll end up going back here underneath um, in the chassis on the sides like this uh, somewhere or I guess I could um, maybe move that over and uh, bring one or two of them up through the chassis here I don't know, I'm going to have to spend some time with uh, either that whiteboard I kind of had drawn out or a pen, pencil and paper. We're trying to cram a lot into a little space here, I'm uh, coming to believe really quickly. But um, I'd rather have it a little bit compact like this than, uh, than all sprawled out and be in a chassis that's uh, so big that it uh, just isn't functional or doesn't fit well on your bench. But Hopefully you've learned something today. There's a lot to be considered. Um, you know, one thing is I could not use this ST style bottle and just use a plain straight uh, sided 5U4. That would take up less space. Um, I could also switch away from the 5U4, maybe go with a uh, GZ34, um, which would take up less space. It's about the size of one of these, and I could end up with it right along in here, and then maybe the capacitor is there. But then I'm changing the design of the circuit, and uh, I think I'm not trying to keep this thing as original as possible. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you learned something uh, about uh, amplifier chassis layout and considerations. And then uh, if you're watching the uh, single ended 807 tube series, this is part nine and yet part 10 will be coming up soon, hopefully, where I actually. Uh, mark this chassis, drill it all out, and start mounting this stuff and wire this thing up and get it working. Thanks for watching everyone.